Most people have some idea of how a figure is modeled bit by bit in clay. Some even know how it's cast in a more permanent material. Few, however, know how it's carved directly from a block of stone. Even fewer know how the subtle swellings of a muscle are made so that they're brought out by the play of light and shadow. Sculpture has the unique quality of being viewed from many vantage points. Therefore, it should be well executed from all sides. My object is to show the process of carving the figure of a seated woman in marble. Yet carving is only one aspect of a long procedure. It really all begins at the quarry, in this case, the Green Mountains of Vermont. The Green Mountains hold some of the finest white marble in America. The stone is taken from a deep pit under one of the mountains. Access is by a long switchback stairway. The stairway leads to a large underground chamber supported by massive pillars. The chamber branches into galleries which follow the marble deposits. Stone taken in blocks of 25 tons, is lifted to the surface in the bucket of a crane. They are taken by rail to mills with overhead gantries equipped for the heavy loads. The marble is cut into slabs or blocks with diamond toothed saw blades or wire saws. Prior to selecting the stone, drawings were made to decide on the final concept. A 5,000 pound block has been selected for carving the figure of a seated woman. A receiving dock is to be built from wood left over from previous undertakings. Recognizing that the block might arrive in the truck turned or laying on its side, various means may be needed to pull it off the truck and rotate it vertically or horizontally. A gantry must also be made to raise the block, move it over an opening in the dock, and lower it onto a work table. The wood is assembled in the driveway of the sculptor's studio in a residential neighborhood. The plan is to move the block off the delivery truck on pipe rollers, then to remove the rollers using a hoist mounted on a gantry. The gantry, which straddles the block, also moves on rollers. The block is brought to an opening in the back of the dock and lowered to a work table. For carving purposes, the table needs to be less than the four foot height of the dock. The table and block is then rolled into the studio. The receiving dock awaits arrival of the delivery truck. Fortunately, the stone is in an upright position in the tail of the truck. This facilitates the offloading. It is also cribbed and wedged high enough for pipe rollers to be inserted. The wedge is removed. It is pulled off the truck. Once on the dock, it is once again wedged in place. Rolled into position, the gantry straddles the stone. The gantry is secured to prevent it from spreading on the load. The block is lifted. A chain is attached to pull the gantry. Gantry and block are rolled over the opening. A final adjustment is made. The stone is lowered onto the work table. The gantry is moved away. The tail of the dock is opened. Wedges, which secure the table in position, are removed. This allows the table to be levered out of the opening. The block wedges are removed. Its protective wood gone, the stone is revealed. A 
level track makes it possible for one man to move the 5,000 pound block with a lever. With the marble in place, the residence returns to its normal appearance. A sculptor's studio is not the picture of order or cleanliness. The model is positioned to be contained within the dimensions of the block. An early concept drawing on the seated model are compared. Life-size sketches are also made. When transferred to the model, they will remind the sculptor where the figure is located. Since marble is costly, great care must be given to carve a figure in stone successfully. To aid in this endeavor, a scale is marked on the edges of the block and on a wooden frame made to the size of the block. The model is seated in the wooden frame and several points of the figure are located. Coordinates of the width, depth, and height of the nose are noted, for example. These are transferred to the marble block. The stone is cut close to the designated area. This is repeated in several key locations. In carving a figure, it is important to cut the stone only in a frontal plane and not undercut until absolutely necessary. In this example, if the nose falls off, the figure can be started again a little deeper in the remaining stone. This method of carving permits the figure to be altered in the case of a mishap or change of concept. Chisels are sharpened on the slow rotation of a pedal-driven grinding wheel. The points, tooth, and flat chisels are the same basic tools used by sculptors for centuries. They are driven by a small block hammer weighing a couple of pounds. Roughing out is done with a pitching tool and a brush hammer having two faces. Since hours of hammering can be tiring, the soft iron tools are deliberately made to deform an impact. The deformation helps to absorb the blows, making it less tiring on the arm. As the iron peens over and flakes off, chisels become shorter with use. In a similar way, depressions are formed in the hammer face. The pitching tool makes fast work of the edge. The blows of the brush hammer are absorbed by the wooden handle. Rough cuttings are made in a flat plane until the depth of the face is reached. With features sketched, the face is shaped with the toothed and flat chisel. The rest of the body is developed in the same way, but always in a frontal plane. As noted earlier, this allows the figure to be pushed back into the remaining stone if necessary. The model stand is placed next to the marble. Elevated above this is the wooden frame. Continued carving exposes a large mass of unneeded marble near the right arm. Since it will not be incorporated in the figure, it is to be saved in one piece. It is cut from both sides until only a supporting web remains. Before being parted, it is tied to a hoist built to take the weight of the 600-pound block. The chain hoist makes this a simple operation. The rescued piece is carved into smaller pieces. With the block removed, the figure is more pronounced. As the point chisel shapes the head, it begins to lose its somewhat Egyptian appearance. As the stone is smoothed, it is compared to the living model.
Carving a statue is the reverse of modeling in clay where the figure is built up with each added piece. Here the figure is revealed as the chips fly off. Large furrows are made with the point chisel. Attention is focused only on the cutting point of the tool. The hammer locates the chisel automatically. The tooth chisel makes the large furrows smaller. The flat chisel flattens the furrows but leaves its own marks. These marks are smooth with rasps of various sizes and shapes called rifflers. Although the chisel marks are removed with rifflers, they leave their own small indents which are later smooth. Having developed the front of the statue, the back is carved. This is the point of no return. Once the figure is carved from behind, only minor changes can be made. The entire process is one of rough marking and cutting, very much like peeling an onion. The hands and feet are blocked out at the small planes. Since they are complicated, they are drawn and carved with more care. Continuing in this way, the fingers and toes become defined. As the figure is formed and smooth, it seems to take on a life of its own. The pitching tool makes short work of a corner. The flattened left hand is easily developed since it has simple planes. For the delicate undercutting of the right hand, the use of small rifflers is required. Assuming a 40 hour week, the figure takes about seven months to carve and another three months for the final smoothing and polishing. The finish and polish consists of a series of steps. Imperfections are removed with the help of a fine toothed riffler, and the stone is smoothed with emery cloth of increasingly finer grades. Soft stones are also used. Pumice powder is rubbed in with a damp felt pad. The same procedure is used with rotten stone, a still finer powder. In a final step, tin oxide is used. The vigorous rubbing seems to harden and seal the surface of the stone. Time-lapse photography shows the figure developed from start to finish. All aspects of the finished statue are seen in the rotating figure. All that remains is the breath of life.